If you have your Bibles, we ask you to turn to the book of Ezra, Ezra chapter 4, and we're going to begin reading in the very first verse. Ezra chapter 4, beginning in the first verse. The Bible says, Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said unto them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as ye do, and we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Eshkarhadon, king of Azer, which built up hither. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the chief fathers of Israel said unto them, you have nothing to do with us to build a, a house unto the, our God, but we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, hath commanded us. Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, the king of Persia, even into the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for your goodness and watch care. Lord, we thank you for your blessings on this little church. Lord, may we stand in the day of adversary. May we stand in the day of goodness. Lord, we pray that, your, that the preaching would yield souls unto yourself. God, we pray for the mission there at Paris that you would grow it according to your mercy and grace. And we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Now, some semi-familiar verses of Scripture. If you know the time of Ezra, it was nearing the end of the captivity. Now, the children of Israel had went into captivity because their rebellion to God uh, because they would not serve him and because they brought in worldly people to rule them. And God said, okay, I'll take you out. Then they went into captivity uh, to Babylon for a number of years as judgment against them. You know, I've often thought about the Babylonian captivity because, listen, uh, the way the world gave it, it wasn't all bad. You got what you wanted to to eat as long as you ate their diet. And you know, it's still that way today. As long as you eat the world's diet, you're okay. But when you say, no, I'm not going to eat it. I'm going to feast on the Word of God. Then you become a hypocrite, and then you become self-righteous. And all those tags that they would put into God's people, you get that when you refuse the world's diet. And, and so we find that it wasn't really, it, it was in that situation when they were feasting on the world that they lost their independence as a nation. And they no longer had it. Now, some years into that, Ezra, working for the king, uh, was, crying, was not happy in his job, and the king knew it. Now, you know the rest of the story gave him authorization to go back and build the temple. And when he got there, if you know your Bible, he was devastated at the city of Jerusalem. You ever get this devastated at the situation of God's churches today? Visiting around, I do. Uh, I look at them and uh, they may be just as doctrinally straight as an arrow, but there's no presence of God there. Tell me. That, that worries me. And so as Ezra came to this place and, and he saw the situation for what it was, if you remember, I think it said he fasted and cried for seven days. You ever cried over the situation of your church or another church and cried that God had withdrawn his spirit? That's the shape Ezra was in. And then he began to use this group of small people. And if you remember, the king uh, himself of Babylon financed the trip. 
He gave the money to rebuild. See, God can make you do, can make an individual do anything that he wants them to do. Do you remember on the night before they uh, fled uh, Egypt in the day of Moses? The Bible said the women went to their masters and asked for gold vessels and jeweled items. And they just said, yeah, you have this. That's, that's what God can do. Right. Not only is he in control of his elect, he's, he's in control of the rebellion as well. We forget about that, don't we? Uh, you know why President Biden is in, is in office? It's because God wanted him there. Absolutely. Right. It, it, it wasn't, now a rebellious nation was used to put him there, but it ain't him, it, it's God. And, and, and so we find the, the very same, and the, now they're finally uh, rebuilding and they're working on the temple. Now let me let me say this because I always love this part of the story and we're not going to get there. Uh, we're going to focus on just a few verses. But do you remember how they rebuilt the wall? Every man rebuilt the section in front of his house. Mm -hmm. Man, that's a way to work together, is it not? And not only does that get the job done, it makes you responsible for your family. Now, man, whether you like it or not, and whether you enjoy it or not, you're responsible for your family, both financially and spiritually. And, and one day you will hold account to that. And, and so we find that that's, at, that that will happen just in a little bit. And now they're working on the place where they meet with God. So in the first verse, the Bible says, Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity built the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, now, anything that is good for the people of God, anything, uh, listen, if it's revival, and, and listen, having a little series of meetings is not a revival. We've came so hooked on that that we believe revival is a series of meetings when you have a guest preacher. You know what revival is when God meets with his people? That's revival. And, and you don't see that much anymore. And, and so we find as soon as the good news reaches the rebellion, they're mad about it. You know what? When, uh, when, when the Lord saves an individual, the devil, the devil goes steal. Now the devil is not an all-knowing being. He is not omniscient. And so you know what? He's so stupid when somebody gets saved, he thought he had the opportunity to keep them from being saved. So he gets mad about it. He gets upset when the Lord saves an individual because he doesn't understand salvation, nor will he ever. And, and, and so we find that in this, uh, just, just like him, his imps get mad at the success of God's people. Verse 2, then, then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said unto them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do, and we do sacrifice unto him since the days of es, of Esarhaddon, king of Aser, which brought us up hither. Now the first approach of Satan's people is going to be compromise. They're going to pretend to be your friend. They're going to, oh, we serve the same God. Well, do you or don't you? You think, you think we uh, serve the same God as the Catholics? We most certainly do not. Mary was not a benevolent being, was she? It was just a piece of flesh that God be decided to use. She's not to be worshipped. Right. In fact, she had a sim she had a sinful nature just like us, and two and I'll give you two reasons. Number one, she had multiple children after Christ was born. Mm -hmm. And then she wanted to interfere with Christ's ministry, did she not? Remember the, the wedding at Cana of Galilee? Right. Yeah, yeah, she wanted that wine, didn't she? Why do you tell her? He says, Woman, my time has not yet come. Mm -hmm. 
And, and so we find that, you know, we're not in all the same boat. We're not all serving the God of the Bible. People don't like that teaching today, but certainly it is true. And so it was in the days of Ezra. Now notice what the response is. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the chief fathers of Israel said unto them, Ye have nothing to do with us to build the house unto our God, but we are all, but we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, hath commanded us. Now you think about what that took. Not only did they stand up to the local government, they also said this, you don't even have a part in this matter. In other words, you don't serve the same God as we do. That's a lie. You, you, you don't understand the nature of the God of the Bible. You, we don't want your help. We don't need your help. And, and so they sent them on the way. Now, it would have been very easy because I'm sure their tools were much more advanced than what the children of Israel, and they had hundreds of men that could <laughs> jump in there and probably rebuild the temple in just a few days, but we don't want it. You know what? We don't need the world. We just don't. And, and so... Coming to that and saying that is sometimes very hard. Verse 4, Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building. Now, I want you to get that real carefully because it, sees, it shows that the opposition does have power. It says that they weakened the hands of God's people. Now, how did that accomplish? How did that come to pass? Well, they troubled them. They got in the way. They, they, maybe they uh, literally said, you can't move that stone back into place. They weakened them. You know what? If they can be weakened in their service of God, you can too. If they can be weakened in the building of the temple, we can be weakened in, in, in sharing the gospel. You ever, you ever get so frustrated that nobody listens anymore? It weakens you after a while, does it not? And, and so we find that the same situation here that the devil's people come on the scene in opposition to the new temple. Verse 5, and hired counselors against them. Now, if if you know the story of the rebuilding of the wall, it was the same situation. What, what was it they said? Uh, not, not, it was, I don't know if it was a cat or a bird. They can't even, that, that wall couldn't even uh, shoo away a cat. You know what? When you worked all day and really hard on something, and somebody comes by and makes that statement, it's discouraging. Right? You can say what you want to, but you'd be discouraged too. Making fun of your work and you've been sweating and pushing on stones all day and come come by and make fun of you. That's that's the attitude, that's the situation with the world. Now, it says, and they hired counsels against them what to frustrate their purpose. Now, in the modern day, I don't think we fully understand the word frustrated. Uh, usually the way we use it, we really should use anger. And because we'll say, oh, he's frustrating me. Now, what you really mean is he's making you angry. He's making you mad. Because frustration comes when you have a purpose and you're moving toward that purpose and somebody's pushing back against you. They're impeding your progress. They're in, they are frustrated your goal. That's true frustration. Now, the only way that you can get past that is to push back. You know what? We don't have any more much of a group, much of a Christian. And when I say that, I mean all the Lord's churches that push back. Go to your average church. Most churches, the people are in their 50s, 70s, and 80s. You know what? I found this from my 30s to my 50s. It's harder to push back than it was when I was in my 30s. 
And, and, and so we find this group. Now, what is the impulse when that happens? Thuyo, I'm done. I'll give up. That, 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 that. And you know what? That's exactly what the frustration, the people that frustrate want. They do not want you to reach the goal. That is their purpose. And, and so we find then that these people were very much uh, in a situation that uh, could have been a quitter. But if you know the rest of your Bible, they pushed back. They went on, and ultimately, the temple was back in order. Now, let me say this. If you know your Bible, the temple was never the same again. Now, they did a good job, and they began to worship again, but it was never the same again. And you say, well, why is that so? Well, uh, they've been beaten by Satan once already. And when we get beaten by Satan... We're not going to be the same when we come out of it on the other side. Can he steal your soul? Certainly not. Can he steal your testimony? You got it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and, and so we find that this was the same situation. And, and when you get frustrated, all I can tell you is push back with everything you got. When you get frustrated and Satan's impeding your progress, you push back with everything that you have. That's how Ezra got the job done. Now go with me if you will, and we're going to just look at a number of scriptures very hurriedly. But I want you to see this has been God's plan for his people for centuries. Isaiah chapter 1 and uh, verse 11. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 11. The Bible says this, When you come to appear before me, who have required this at your hand to tread upon my courts? I'm sorry, I read 12, verse 11. To what purpose is this multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of the lambs and the goats. And, and so I want you to see that in this, uh, the Lord God is frustrated at their condition. They brought everything that they were supposed to, and they did everything that was uh, needful, but there was no worship in it. You ever felt like you brought, and, and listen, everybody in this building this morning has a good King James Bible. And we bring that, and we look into it, but have you, have you ever thought that that's just out of habit? Have you ever thought that maybe that just, you do it just because you're used to doing it? You know what? That really frustrates God. It frustrates you. It impedes your progress. You too old to make progress? I don't think you're ever too old to make progress to you. Uh, nearness unto the Lord, closer unto His will, that, that never stops as, uh, as God's people. Now go me to Isaiah 14. Now, if you know your Bible, the story of casting Satan to the earth is in Isaiah 12. Um, Isaiah 14 and verse 22. Isaiah 14 and verse 22, uh, the Bible says this, for I will raise up against them, saith the Lord of hosts, and cut off from Babylon the name, the remnant, and son, and nephew, saith the Lord. I will also make it a possession for the veteran and pools of water, for I will sweep it from besom of destruction, saith the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts hath sworn, saying, as I have Thought, so have I come to pass, and I have purposed, so shall it stand. Now, I want you to see that we live in a day and age where the purpose of God is thought to be thwarted, is thought to be affected, uh, the thought to be uh, slowed down. Now let me say this, God's purpose has never been chiming, not even one time. And you know why? Because he's sovereign. 
Now, we get in that frustrated position, even as Ezra did, but listen, the God's works by purpose and design. He always has. He always will. And you know what? To me, where that's where faith begins. When you get devastating news, listen, my God is still on the throne. When you get difficulty in your life, when there's more month than money, listen, my God is still on the throne. He still doeth all things well. That is the God of the Bible. And so, as you're thinking about that, when the most devastating news comes to your ear, remember there's purpose behind it. There's purpose. Now, when we get a check in the mail for about two or three thousand dollars, woohoo! Right? We see God's purpose in that. But what about when the doctor shakes his head and just walks away? Do you see purpose in that? Very important, is it not? That's the same way. That's the same thing. And God has a unique purpose for everybody in this building this morning. Uh, your responsibility, and I did say responsibility, yeah. is to find it. And once you find it, do it. That is your responsibility. And, and so we see that our God, in every situation, in every design, it's always been by purpose. He created this place which we live. Why? To glorify Himself. That was His purpose. That was His reason. What's His purpose for you? What's His purpose for the last things that have happened in your life Find the purpose. Jeremiah chapter 4. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 28. Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 28. The Bible says this. For this shall the earth mourn, and the, and the heavens above be black, because I have spoken it, I have purposed it, and will not repent, neither will I turn back from it. Now, Eric and I have talked about Indian Mount, and I don't know why, but he makes more calls down there than anywhere else in this county. He cuts tree after tree after tree after uh, storm so the road will be passable. And you know what? A lot of times it ain't two months he's in the same place cutting again. Why is Indian Mound getting beat up? Because God purposed that way. Because he made it that way. Because it was his desire to see it done. Everything that happens. Not a breeze blows by your head that God didn't offer. So don't get frustrated. Don't, don't get upset. When, when, when everything around you sees, uh, seems to be calamity, calamity, listen, God's still on the throne and He still doeth all things well and His purpose is being accomplished. Jeremiah chapter 49. Uh, Jeremiah 49 in uh, verse 20. Jeremiah 49 in verse 20. The Bible says this, Therefore, Hear the counsel of the Lord. Now, how frequently do we do that? First of all, let me say, you can't hear without listening, and you can't listen without prayer. And, and, and so, I want you to see his advice, his demand. Therefore, hear the counsel of the Lord that he have against Edom, and his purposes that he have proposed against the inhabitants of of Taman. Now, I want you to see any destruction that you see, there's a purpose behind it. How much peace have you seen in the Middle East in your lifetime? I'm 52 and I've never seen any yet. It's always upheaval. It's always a fight. It's always war. And if I understand the Bible correctly, it always will be. But why do we see that? Why do we see seemingly a section of the country continually torn about by war? 
God purposed it. He made it a design. He said, in fact, he has spoken against that very region of the world. There would never be peace there. And you know what? He's been faithful to it, is he not? Uh, I've never known any anybody come up with an idea about, about settling the middle in the Middle East. But you know what? If I understand this book like I think I do, there will come one with a plan of peace, and it'll work for about three and a half years. That is the God of the Bible. Now let's take it down to the New Testament, Acts chapter 26. Now if you know your Bible, Paul is giving his testimony of salvation. And I certainly like to hear that among people. Um, uh, that they can give an accounting of when the Lord saved their soul. And everybody thinks that's a little bit Armenian. Well, if it is, then Paul was an Armenian, wasn't he? Because he said it over and over and over again. So we find in Acts 26, verse 16, the Bible says this, the Lord Jesus Christ speaking, But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things into which I will appear unto thee. Now notice I want you to see that Jesus Christ, that portion of God, had a purpose in Paul. And this was his purpose that the gospel may be taken unto the Gentiles. That, that they may, that we may hear of the goodness of God. That we might understand and know redemption. But notice what else he says. And the things which appear unto thee. Now if you know your Bible, there was a great many things that he talked to the church years after this instance would happen. He, he wrote to all the churches that he helped to organize. He gave them uh, uh, the very basis of what a church should look like. He has a purpose. And if you remember this, I think he was writing to Timothy the second time. He says this, I'm now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. You know why he believed that? Because his purpose was fulfilled. Yeah. Now, the big question is this, are you fulfilling God's purpose for you? Because I don't, this, this is my own opinion, I don't believe you can ever experience uh, the perfect will of God until you do that, until you find His purpose, and it may be as simple as washing dishes in the kitchen to going in the far reaches of this world of ours and preaching the gospel, but everyone under the sound of my voice has a purpose because our God is always worked by purpose and design. Ever since the beginning, when he said, let there be light, he's always operated under those uh, principles. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, most of us can quote it. And we know that all things, everything that happens, every no sniffle, Ever bounce check, but you really can't bounce them no more uh, because they run that little number through there before you ever leave this door. Uh, but ever late or delinquent bill, ever drop of water. Uh, Donna's kind of fussing about the weather this morning, wondering how we can get Joey to the car. You know what? That rain had purpose. Did it not? Every drop that struck everywhere was defined by the purpose of God. Now, when you begin to see that, you'll begin to understand the God that we serve. We're not, we're not serving just the God that created the storm. We're, we're, we're serving the God that made the rain. Every drop of it, wherever it hit, wherever it went, that's the God we serve. And so we never should be frustrated by the plan of God in our life because He does it after the counsel of His own will. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love the for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to 
His purpose. He doesn't do it by accident. For whom he did foreknow, he also did, also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. He works by purpose. Ephesians chapter 1, Paul writing to the church of Ephesus. And uh, don't know exactly what was going on. If you know your church letters, this is probably one of the more easy ones to swallow. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 9. Having made, un, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. Now what's the mystery? It's your, it's your purpose and your, and, and your responsibility to figure it out. To know what the will of God is for your life. To follow having made known the mystery of his will according to the good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. What's the good will of God in your life? Let me say this. When you get in God's will, it will never be wrong. Now, with that said, it may be painful. You may get some bumps in the road. You know, that's the problem with Armenian teaching and, and, and these Joel Osteens and people like that. There's no bumps in the road with them. Well, you know what? After uh, 27 years of the ministry, there have been plenty of bumps for me. You know what? And I'm not complaining. I've just learned to accept God's will. I, I'll even go this far to say the ride's been rough. Whenever uh, me and Donna was at South Road, I didn't know if we was gonna get I didn't know if I was gonna get her and the kids out of there. But you know what? God had a purpose in it. Listen, when I resigned, they wasn't balling. <laughs> right? But God had a reason. So we find then as the Lord's people. Uh, whatever the will of God is, if it is for you to have a million dollars, or if it is for you to drive a new uh, a, a new car, good. But if it is for you to drive an 88 Yugo, give God the praise. Especially if it gets you there and gets you back. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 11. According to the eternal purpose which he hath purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now I want you to see that first of all, that purpose is an eternal purpose. Have you ever had somebody that just gets under your skin? Now, don't lie to me. Right? And uh, I've had a few of those recently. And it gets so frustrating. And, and you pray, Lord, well, I am so sick of this. You know where? Somewhere in there is an eternal purpose. And you know when they'll leave? Right when God wants them to leave. There's an eternal purpose. There's a reason why. All throughout eternity. You think about the things that really let you down. And you remember God's eternal purpose. Uh, I don't even know if God remembers this, but that the last semester of college, me and Donna had moved back to Dover, which I don't know if was our best decision, but again, God's purpose and design, right? And that was one of the worst winters I remember. It came an ice storm the day we moved home. All the lights went out, and we had one little gas heater in the basement. Thought we was going to freeze to death. <laughs> Then, got back into school, it was a little bit better. Drove from here to Dyersburg, Tennessee, on the Mississippi River for my stupid critical care labs. <laughs> Have to leave at 3 in the morning to get there. Drove all the way over there. Worst snowstorm I'd ever been in. Got there. Well, our, our professor, I'm going to let y'all go. I just want to go. <laughs> Got back, and that's when we did, truly had the little, the hot suit charade. You, know, you uh, um, in laws will remember that. That that was like a you go, but cheaper. And um, I was, and it was about this far off the ground. And I was pushing snow by the time I got back to Dover. I, I literally would have to get out and kick the snow out in front of the truck and keep going. 
And you know what? I was so mad at that. And I, I didn't know what then. Because at that time, I didn't understand that God was sovereign. And all I could do is be mad at Miss Gibbs. But God had a purpose in that. I learned to drive in the snow. <laughs> Then a few months, a few weeks later, another snowstorm come, and I had a term paper due. And I won't say this woman because she still practices. She's a she's a nurse practitioner now in Gleason. But me and here, her butted heads on a good day. And here I was in the middle of nowhere, pre-internet, nothing to pull up on uh, Google, had no resources right whatsoever. So I did a term paper. And my 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 uh, resources were at least fifteen years old. You know what I got on it? A sixty. And I looked at my grade, and I began to figure with my calculator. And I was like, "I'm sitting there." I said, "There's no way I can pass this semester. You just failed me." And that meant. Waiting all summer, re-entering the program, and doing it all together again. I didn't see the purpose of God in that. But you know what? It made me work harder. You know what all my grades in that class were for the first, the, ne the rest of the semester? 100, 100, 100, and it sounds good, right? I got to see you in class. <laughs> but I covered, I covered the 60. See, God has a purpose. You know what it taught me this? To study good. Because I knew if I was going to make it, I had to ace every test that came my way. And by God's grace, I did it. You know what? There was a purpose behind it. Always is. What are you struggling with this morning? I guess I always think about illness because of my profession. I've seen some very sad cases and wonder, why is this happening? You ever ask yourself, now be honest, why is this happening to me, to my family? Why is this occurring? I've tried to serve you. Why is this happening? Give it some time. Give it some time. Amen. And the purpose will come. Now, I've been blessed, I think, to see most purposes in the prospect of time. So now it's taken a long time. Uh, took me about 30 years to see why my daddy left. And I came to this. I sure certainly did not need him as an example. Right? God had a purpose in it. So what what is your thing this morning that's troubling you? You know, sometimes we don't need to do anything but go to the Lord and say, I love you. I said, but I don't understand. Yeah. I, I don't understand. And you know what? What I have found in my own life, that's enough. I remember when I was told that they were going to have to do some type of surgery or I would keep having seizures once or twice a week for the rest of my life. And Donna had Kelly and Andrew out in, out in the lobby. They couldn't come back with me because they could be a little while. And I came out and we walked away and I said, well, Donna, I'm going to have brain surgery. And I know I could tell by looking at her, she thought I was being a little cavalier about it. Uh, a, a little unconcerned that they were going to crack my skull and take part of it out. But you know, I'd already been assured by God there was purpose in it. There was a reason behind it. And we can take peace of the Lord and know that He is working a purpose. Why did the Lord God save you? It wasn't to keep your soul out of hell. A lot of people want to jump to that, don't they? The only purpose He saved you is that you might magnify Him and give glory to His name. That's the only reason He saved you. The benefit of not spending eternity in hell, in hell is really secondary. 
You ever think about that? That's why you don't want to go to hell, do you? It's really a mock thing unto God, is it not? I want to serve Him. Yeah. What about you? What stands in your way? And every one of us would be lying to say, we oh, nothing. Now, you might be at the nothing stage, and you might be in the, in the perfect will of God. But you're going to have some people come away, come your way, just like they did Ezra, and frustrate the situation. Just when you think you're serving him. Come by. How about memories of the past? Now, a lot of y'all don't have to struggle with that like I do. But when I talk to my friends, and that I'm practically, and I use friends loosely, and I'm practically laughing stop to them. You know what? That's, that's frustrating progress, is it not? What about you? Do you trust him enough? Do you trust him enough that even at the worst moment, you know God's there?